Um, and then what happens is this um, thin linker plugin, all it does is simply aggregate at a minimum, at a minimum, it just <coughs> aggregates these function indexes into a global map of functions. So where I can find each function, which module, and it's offset into the IR. Um, and this uh, is essentially is what is used by the backend um, parallel processes to import on demand. Um, because we're importing at the function level, it minimizes this overall memory gain and also the IO um, overhead. Okay, so um, what do we use to decide how to import? Um, and I'll go into more detail on these a little bit later, but um, so one is that you can record in the function index also some minimal summary information that you've um, com uh, computed during parsing. Um, if you have profile data, you can record some information there. Um, and you could um, potentially do, if you're willing to pay um, more costs, or anything, you could do enable greater amounts of um, analysis in this linker plugin. Uh, so the advantage of this is that this thin linker plugin is very, very minimal. It does, by default, does no IPA. Um, it doesn't do any IR reading, uh, rewriting, partitioning. It's simply aggregating those maps. Um, and the advantage is that it can scale to very, very large programs. Um, at the same time, um, it, you can enable IPO um, on machines that actually have small memory footprints, um, and it's without greatly increasing uh, compile time. And um, I'll talk a little bit later about distributed build systems, but for a single node uh, thin LTO build, then um, the idea is this linker plugin will um, actually launch these parallel backend jobs, and when they're done, um, feed the dados back to the linker, which is what happens during a tra traditional LTO build. Okay, so advantages, like I mentioned, um, it's the thin linker plugin layer is very minimal. It doesn't require a lot of memory. It's very fast. We have a fully parallelizable backend. Um, it's transparent to the user, um, similar to classic LTO. The, all this is kind of hidden behind the linker plugin, so the user does like to bubble dash C um, front end, uh, first phase uh, compile, and then pass everything to the linker, and it's all kind of hidden there. Um, and unlike LIPO, you don't actually require profile. So you have a state. You have you have to uh, have gone through the front end before you can collect all the, the indices. Yes. So so you cannot have that kind of uh, happen later after the indices are collected. So you have like this, all the client thing, C line thing goes through mm -hmm. and it dumps out the. So that's like the serialization that you have to do for the two, right? Well, that's all in parallel though. So that's this part. This is the dash C compile yeah. essentially, and that, those can all happen in parallel. You can do X. You know, for each of these modules, translation units, you can do all your dash C things in, in parallel. And then they all just synchronize right here. So, just yeah. to seem to be explicit, each of these dash C compilers just claim dash C dash F L T O dash whatever. Yes. It's, and nothing changes on that part. And right, except just... for generating the function index. Yeah. Oh, but the, I mean, the BEC already has a function index in there as well. But it's the, a little bit different. Okay. I mean, it's actually the offset into the bit code that. And I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to walk through these in a little okay. bit more detail, so hopefully that will address some of the questions. Um, okay, so high performance should be close to LTO. Um, and if you want to do peak optimizations, you could optionally enable more heavyweight analysis in that plugin. Um, and then it's also from single build machines and also um, distributed build systems. And then the end goal of what we believe is that it's therefore possible to enable this by default which is what we're um, hoping to do. Okay, so now to walk through these things. So the, the phase one, which is the generation of these um, the IR and function summary. Okay, so you can generate, like I was saying, the IR files can be all be generated in parallel. So just a normal dash F L T O dash C compile. Um, but in addition, it generates this function index table, which is just a map between the functions and their offsets in the bit code. 
Um, and then also in this table, there's a little bit of function summary data encoded that helps drive later importing decisions. So, um, for example, looking at the size in terms of the number of instructions at parsing, um, branch count, other things you could think of adding there. Um, if you have profile data, you can add in some information about the function hotness. Um, and then there's some questions about, okay, so now how do you represent this? And there's a couple of options I'm going to talk about on a later slide. <clears throat> so you don't store any uh, parameters, arguments, of the functions on how they're called, if they're constants, or if they came from another place? So you, and there's probably a variety of different summary information that you could mm -hmm. you could encode. Right now, I haven't it's just the prototype, right. but um, I mean, I think <coughs> there's actually a lot of possibilities. And we talked about internally about you know a few different things. I mean, some might you know basically anything that will help you help tell you whether this is something that's going to be useful that you might in mind um, and give you good. Benefit. It's not just in line. It's like if if all of the other functions are calling this function with a constant, yeah. then just ignore this in, in the same constant. Say, just ignore the argument, or you know, to you can optimize the other, the function is being called, not the function that's calling. No, I mean, that's independent. Like, I mean, that's a meta, that's a extra information on the IR, right? It's... You have that in IR. Oh, you could add, but I mean, that's independent of how you. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's just mean that if, if, if it's in the function, you can do that at a link time as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, and I'm not sure I totally follow what you're saying, but I mean, I, you know, there, there's, I mean, I think there's a number of different types of information that you could think, um, put into the, to the summary to drive basically any other cross-module cross optimizations is particularly what we're, we're looking at because we want to decide whether to import this and other modules. So if it's useful, I mean, I haven't, we haven't explored all the possibilities, so those are just a few that I've, I thought about and started implementing. Um, okay. So <coughs> phase two is this, Thin linker plugin. Um, so, like I mentioned, it's launched via a linker plugin, um, as with LTO is in today. Um, and by what all it's doing is simply combining these per module function indexes into a thin archive. Um, you could add in heavier weight IPA if you wanted to for peak, peak optimization um, and save that in the combined summary as well. Um, so, uh, okay, and also. In order to keep the size of this map down and also to reduce the number of import candidates that you think about later, um, you could eliminate, you could aggressively prune out um, candidates that are unlikely to be useful to inline from. So, for example, just um, for LiPo, where we're importing the whole module, even for hot modules that we import, we find that we only actually end up inlining from 5 to 10% of them. Um, so, there's a lot of cases that you could probably just prune out from the map, like very large functions that you're not likely to find as a profitable inline candidate, you know, put them in or from your profile data or static profile analysis, if you know that it's unlikely or cold, um, you may not want to put that in. Um, Comdats, um, we found for um, some of our large applications that like, I think 15% of the um, functions are actually Comdats. Um, you can eliminate all of the copies and just have one copy of a Comdat in there. Um, and then, so, the, the last thing after um, generating this combined map is that you generate a backend compile make file. And for a single node build, just um, you can simply launch the parallel make and then resume the final link. Uh, okay, so then the third phase is this, this backend, parallel backend, uh, with demand-driven IPO. Um, so the idea here is you do this iterative function importing, um, where the priority is determined both by the summary and also by the call set context when you're optimizing the module. Um, and then you use this index in the combined function map to actually do the, the import and to do it efficiently. Um, so as in a typical, when you're doing LTO today, you typically as you're pulling in other modules, you have to do global value uh, symbol linking. So that's also something you need to do as you're pulling in these functions. Um, it's modified a little bit because the linkage types have to be a little bit different. Um, specifically, um, one thing you have to consider that's not an issue for LTO, but is an issue for us with LiPo, is the potential need for statics being promoted um, and being renamed carefully. Um, so for example, you could, after importing and inlining, you could end up with uh, actually a cross-module reference to something that was actually file static. So you need to figure out when that's gonna happen and promote it um, if necessary. Um, but actually, with some careful importing, we've been able to reduce the number of static promotions that are required quite a bit. Um, and then, as the names are unique, 
Um, sometimes when you link in, you have duplicate names of you know, similarly named um, file statics. They are, are typically unique today just on the fly. In LTO, you have to be very careful to rename them consistently across modules. Um, OK, so that's another consideration. Uh, another thing that you do is um, then debug, import the debug information. And to do this efficiently, you want to do this lazily after you're done with uh, importing. And then finally, after you're done with all the importing, you can simply do IP cross-module optimization as you would normally on this now extended module. And once that's done, you can actually uh, then just discard anything that wasn't that was imported but not in mind. Um, there's a couple specific cases where you can't, but for the most part, you can eliminate all those at that point. Um, and then finally, just the rest of the normal comp comp compilation and optimization. <clears throat> Okay, so how do you decide what to import? Um, ideally, because while well, we're thinking most typically about cross-module inline, ideally you would like to import as close of a superset to the um, functions that you would find profitable to inline as possible. Um, so we use both the summary information and the call site context to um, evaluate whether it's profitable. Um, another thing to note is LTO does pretty aggressive internalization of uh, globals. Or sorry, uh, uh, sorry. <coughs> Those are are very aggressively internalized. Um, one of the advantages from that is that the inliner will actually give a pretty heavy benefit to candidates that are uh, local linkage, um, so things that have been internalized and they're called once. Um, so we can't I internalize in thin LTO because we don't have the full um, the full application in one compile. Um, but there are some ways of actually getting a little bit of that benefit. Um, we can record in the summary when something's been called once and then um, import that. Um, and then the um, inlining heuristics can be modified to look at something that's imported but marked as called once as um, having the same kind of benefit as it applies to, to internalized uh, symbols. And then if you have profile data, you can be much more accurate um, in terms of what is hot and important to inline. Um, and one thing that I want to call out is that um, indirect calls are tricky for um, thin LTO. Because you're importing things where you see a call to it, if you see an indirect call and you don't know where the indirect call's going, it's kind of okay. Um, so what is really important to us for LiPo and what will be important to us here also is doing um, indirect call profiling and promotion in that stage one for the compile so that we can see what the hot targets are and actually import those in, um, in line. Can I add one question to it? Might it might be a little bit stupid, but how does this work with incremental builds? Um, okay, I'm gonna actually. Can you hold that because I'm actually gonna talk. Okay. About it. Yeah, I'm gonna mention something about that. Yeah. Um, okay. So let's see. Oh, and I, I talked about, about the uh, static permissions earlier. Okay. So um, I mentioned earlier um, this issue of what format do we use for the function maps. Um, I've kind of deferred this right now. I'm for my prototype. I'll mention this later. I'm just using text files to save that on the side. Um, but there's a couple of main options. One is as bit code. So um, the stage one per module function maps would be actually just represented in metadata. Um, and then when you aggregate them in the stage two with a plug plugin, um, you um, basically would either you could probably encode it as a on this cache table like the profile data. Um, the issue is that tools, if standard tools like LD-R and AR have to be invoked then with a um, special plugin that knows how to handle this. Um, another possibility is with ELF wrappers. Um, so there was some recent support added to LVM to understand bit code or ELF wrap bit code. So we could use that and then um, encode the function maps as special ELF sections. Um, and then the combined map would just use the AR format to combine all these special ELF sections. Um, the advantage of that is that all these tools just work. And so there's the transparency with the standard tools versus the sort of ease of quickly adding this into LVM that are sort of trade-offs. I'm curious to get people's feedback on that. Okay, distributed build system. So this is where I just mentioned a little bit about incremental builds. So I'm um, kind of running out of time, so I'm gonna go through this a little bit fast. But um, so Oh, okay, thank you. So what we're um, considering doing is having um, a little bit of analysis in the plugin layer using either profile data if you have it, or just heuristics in the simple table to compute a 
can be a fairly large set of IR files that you will probably <coughs> work from and stage those. Um, now this ties into incremental builds. Um, so your first stage, you know, your dash C, dash F, LTO build, which generates bit code, so it's parallelizable, it always was and still will be. Um, now the back end compiles, it would be great if those could be as incremental as possible. I mean, if you change one file, you don't want to necessarily have to rebuild, do, redo the whole parallel back end. Um, if you have these um, pre-computed um, dependent sets for staging, then this um, enables the back end to be a bit more incremental as well, because now we only need to rebuild if one of those files changed. So it helps a little, a little bit there. <clears throat> and here's just a picture of how we're planning to, use, to, to do this on the rebuild system. So um, we're just gonna split the, um, the final link into a few different cases. And um, so the, this, the thin linker plugin will generate this combined function map. Um, in addition, it will compute these, the imports files of these pre-computed dependencies, and it will also compute a map, mapping from the IR to the final link, um, and stop there so the link will terminate without actually generating real object files. And then the parallel back end system has to have a little bit of knowledge of, of what's going on here, um, and is able to take that information, um, these two pieces of our information, and then um, stage these, these parallel backends. Um, and then it also has to then do the final link. Okay, so um, the interesting part for LLVM. So I uh, implemented a prototype of this in uh, LLVM. So I've added uh, the support for generating these per module function um, ind index and summary tables. Um, and for now, um, because I haven't decided on the, the format, I'm just including some side of text files for each, um, each module. And then I've implemented support both in the Google plugin and in the LLVM LTO driver um, to optionally do both the stage two, uh, linker plugin layer, and also um, the stage three, the backend with importing under options. And I've been testing this, um, it's working on all the spec 2006 benchmarks. Um, Okay, whoops, oh yeah. Um, okay, so just some more details on the prototype. Um, the thin LTO importing is an SCC pass. It's right before, I think it's right before inlining. Um, and so I'm able to leverage a lot of the existing support um, for, LT, uh, for LTO module linking. Um, I had to do a number of thin LTO specific changes. Um, a lot of them like linkage types, handling, and um, some other things. And I have just some initial history, pure success <coughs> with for guiding and importing decisions. So I'm recording the number of instructions of a parsing, um, some profile data, which I haven't really measured the effects of that, but I've looked at recording that in there. Um, and then I've also looked at adding a little bit of support to the, the plugin layer to read the IR and record from, uh, call counts. Um, so this is more heavyweight, but it gives me an idea of whether we can do some of what internalizations getting with uh, respect to inline. Um, I've implemented a um, minimized static promotion. So um, basically, uh, with minimized static promotion, whenever you import a function that calls static functions, you import those, force import those static functions as well, and that helps eliminate these newly cross-module calls to statics that you have to promote. Um, and it means that you only have to static promote address exposed um, statics. Um, I'm renaming statics by appending the MD5 hash of the module name. Um, I've enhanced global DC that runs after inlining and after the cross module optimizations to then remove all those imported functions that weren't inline, um, except for the few special cases. And then the other thing I've done is I've imported, I've uh, implemented lazy de debug import. Um, it's a post pass of this new uh, the LTO pass. Um, and it's basically, what it does is it kind of trans determines what is sort of the like transitively needed. Um, for all the functions that you imported in terms of the DS subroutine and all the types, and et cetera. And um, imports those, and then I have to use this complicated bookkeeping to basically, you know, for any metadata, debug metadata that was attached to instructions that you imported earlier, they have temporary metadata, and um, you have to do some bookkeeping to suture those back together. Um, okay, so some caveats on performance data. Um, I've done very little tuning. It's mostly, most of the work I've been doing is actually implementing the framework. Um, so what I'm doing right now is for the importing decisions, I'm just limiting to small functions. Um, 
And I've also tried allowing this more aggressive importing and mining when there's a single use. Um, I haven't tried using profile data yet. Um, again, as I noted before, it's negatively impacted by the fact that there's no indirect call profile and promotion in stage one. So indirect calls are uh, a black box. Uh, and I ran these all on six core, core i7s. Um, they were locked and I ran three times and um, so they were quiet and took the average. Okay, so there's, this might be a little hard to read. <laughs> I'm just realizing, but I'll try to interpret. So the blue bar, is, this is all speed up compared to dash 02. So blue bar is LTO. <coughs> the two bars on the right, red and yellow, are both thin LTO. Um, the red bar is thin LTO just importing small functions, anything that has less than about 100 instructions the first time. LTO2 is the same thing, but I've added in more aggressive um, importing of single call functions, and I've also made some changes to the inliner to apply that same um, call once um, heuristic to those functions. Okay, so what you can see, there's kind of a range right now. Um, there are cases where, like, for deal II and a star, there's a few of them that where we're not getting much of the benefit of LTO yet. Um, there's a few cases where we're getting like uh, this is saying like BMK, um, Pavre, Omnit PP. I'll talk about that in a second. But um, H264 ref, Go BMK, this is GCC, this is Pearl Dutch. Um, there's a number where it's getting very close to or the same benefit as LTO right now. Um, okay, so this guy, these two are kind of interesting. If I take LTO and I disable internalization, I get the same performance as thin LTO and the same performance as thin LTO. So these two, for better or for worse, internalization is causing some LTO performance. So this is a benefit for LTO, is it uh, mainly from inlining? Uh, because the NAMD is not a inlining case, is it? Well, so NAMD, NAMD is not getting a whole lot here. Yeah, but uh, I'm just wondering, okay, so that is 12% better, isn't it, LTO? I mean, which one, which one, this one right here? Yeah. This is DLII. That's DLII. Oh, yeah, sorry, yeah, so it's really hard to see with all the benchmarks I have here. This one is DLII. Okay. And so yeah, LTO is getting a lot of benefit, and is I have it, not looked at that one. Is it only from inline line question? Is it because of something else? So this is LTO, and I, I haven't actually looked at why. I mean, that would, this is on my list of things I want to look at, is what we're missing here within, because thin LTO is not getting the LTO benefit, and I don't know for this one exactly why. Yeah, I don't know why it, where that's from. Package key program is rarely gain out of inline. Yeah, so I don't I don't know where the LTO performance benefit is coming from. This, this is compilation speed up, right? No, this is this is runtime performance. Run time. So it's been optimized. Run it. This is actually how much speed up do you get by optimizing with LTO? Speed up of the final benchmark. Okay. And I'll show compilation yeah, time in a minute. Yeah, because that's, that's what we're trying to do. Right, yeah, yeah. so this is just the performance. Work. Okay, so now that I've gone through that, oh, and the average over here is, it's kind of close, but a lot of it's driven by this on the PP side of this. All right, here we go. Okay, so build time comparison. So I wanted to compare memory and time on the build time. So this is running on my workstation, uh, which I was, was quiet during the measurements. It's really beefy, it's 210 core. Xeons, 64 megs of, sorry, 64 gigs of memory, um, like the same benchmarks. And I wanted to point out that I mean, you're seeing some interesting trends here, but these are small compared to real world, see world, real world C++ application. Okay, so I wanted to compare the, the times in the memory. And so what I did to keep this fair for just plain O2 is I wanted to compare the times in memory after parsing. So all of these use the same um, bit code files as input. Um, so for O2 specifically, I'm using LLC O2 so that I could exclude the parse time from O2 as well. And okay, so for LTO, it's just the time measured for you know the whole LTO backend. For thin LTO and for just and for O2, I'm taking the max of any of the mod individual compiles because the idea is that these are all going to run in parallel, and they do for O2 right now, and they will they do can for thin LTO. So take the max memory and the max time um, and compare them. Okay, so this is no dash G, no debug information. Um, and so blue bar is O2, red bar is LTO, and yellow is thin LTO. And this was my thin LTO one, the one with the, just, just importing smaller than 100 functions. Um, and it's really hard to read the numbers here, but, and the benchmarks, but this is GCC, this is Zanglang, um, Omnet PP, H264 ref, Pavre, 
DLII, GoBMK, ProBunch. So the two big C benchmarks and the, the big C++ applications. So you can see LTO um, compile time is fairly large, and then LTO is quite close to regular too. And this is the memory um, comparison for the same um, no dash G. Um, very similar trends. Then LTO is a little bit, a little bit more than um, O2, than O2, and but it's quite a bit closer to O2 than LTO. Okay, so this is with dash, same thing, but with dash G, with debug information. Um, the scale over here has changed, so these bars are actually higher than they were in the prior one, which obviously because they have debug information. Um, but again, you see the NL2 is a little bit more here for GCC and Xilin. Let me go back and compare. Uh, they're maybe a little bit higher, relatively, but um, they're, they're still fairly close to O2. That's compile time. And this is memory comparison with dash G. So again, you know, this is what we were assuming when we designed this, is that basically thin LTO is much, much closer to O2, much more scalable, and which for us um, is really important. We have a lot of really, really large uh, C++ applications. Okay, so that's about it. Um, just ne next steps, number one thing is to decide in the file formats for the, um, the function maps in the modules and also the, the combined function map. Um, and then fine tuning the import heuristics, um, integrating with profile feedback. Um, specifically, um, we really need to have some kind of uh, indirect call permission um, and profiling. Um, and then distributing, oh, sorry, integrating with our distributed build system. And then finally, I also like to start actually staging some upstream patches um, now that I'm out of getting out of the prototyping stage. Um, and so working on that. That's it. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay. So yeah. Um, so for the map format, why exactly do you need an on the side map for functions? Okay. So he was asking about that. I'm going to repeat the question. Um, for the map format, why do I need to decide on the format? So the the function oh, map. Is it's not just like a simple table. It's I mean you could encode it as a simple table, but you also you need the main thing we need out of there is um, the index into the bit code file. So during that stage one compiler, we're writing the bit code. I'm also what I've added into like my LVM prototype is I'm keeping track of for each function what is it starting index into the bit code that I'm writing, and then that is what gets put into the the function map. Why? And because when we import then when we look up in the so that all gets then aggregate into a combined function map. So when you want to import, you say, okay, I want this function, okay, consult my map, where's the IR file, what's, what was the path to it, and also what offset within the bit code file. So I can just scan right there and import it. It's just to make importing, you don't, I guess you, you could implement the importing without that, you'd have to parse much more and then find your function, but I mean, it just makes the, the function, it makes the parsing of that IR when you do importing much faster. You can just go more directly there. So when I, you get to the functions. I can see the point for like when you write the merged one, mm -hmm. but just for the each dot o file. Yes. So just for like a number, like right now, creating an, a, a fat archive of all of libsema takes uh, 0 0.35 seconds. Mm -hmm. So you for just the dot o itself you might be able to get away with just plain IR. And just and, scanning into the function. Yeah, to yeah, the like uh, the way IR is structured, you don't need to read the function bodies. Okay. So like it's. It's just like you read one funk, going to read an entry, you just find the size, skip it, find the size, skip it, find the size, skip it. So you're saying that actually the information is already there? It's like, already there on the uh, just on the BC file. So you know when you get to the table, when you get to, when you scan, when you read the IR and you get to the point you, where there's function. The bitcode reader knows the it, offset. It's not exporting it, but I mean, you can get the bitcode reader to tell you. Without actually having to actually parse the whole thing first? Mm -hmm. So it just has to skip because when it gets to an entry, it knows how big it is, so it doesn't need to read the function body. Is that the page in the whole file though, so it doesn't really buy you anything? Yeah, well, it buys you. Like it's like it's really really fast. It's like building a fat archive is zero thirty five seconds. Oh, so this is is this a regular? Bit Re code, regular. Com com so, given like the large program you have, like how far along does a regular LTO goes before it just dies? Can you combine the? Uh, oh, I the, don't remember that. So can you combine? So yeah, can you, has looked at this a little bit. I think. Uh, yeah, for, for one of our large programs, 
I can't I can't load uh, more than half of the bit code with 64 gigs of RAM. But that's with debugging info, right? And without debugging info, I get a little bit further ahead, but I can't. You, can you alert them link? No. Just the files? No. So just another data point too for, for LiPo, which we're using in GCC where you import the whole module and I was mentioning you have to kind of cap the module group size. We bump up against that and our yeah. our our limits for a single compiler are like 12 gig, I think right now is the limit. Yeah. And we have to be really careful not to hit that. And so for some of our hot big applications. So it's definitely for us a, a, a real problem, yeah, unfortunately. Problem for it, yeah. yeah. Question. Uh, uh, do you, this approach, is, are there any missed opportunities for the inline? For example, like A is to inline B and B has an inline C. Yeah, okay, so, so that's a, I mean, that's an interesting, um, that's an interesting uh, point. So if you're inlining, uh, yeah, I mean, if you're, your inline benefit comes from like two calls later, right. um, it's, it, yeah, you, that's, that's a tricky thing. I mean, if you can figure out some of that, and encode it in the summary information. Um, if some of that's like intramodule information, like I know that um, you know these two functions within this within this one module are are beneficial to inline. I could potentially record that in the, the function um, summary. Um, so we're going to be looking for those opportunities. But yeah, that's, that's definitely um, one place where you have to be aware that there's an issue. I, I, I saw okay. I think like I think we're running a little bit okay. over time, so we there's still a break, and so some people may want to copy so we can, we have had just two quick questions and then okay. the rest of them. I think there were like two hands. Quick one. Okay. I've seen some unfortunate <laughs> build systems that they will just stuff <laughs> modules in like right. static libraries and pull okay. them at the time. Huh? Okay. Will that information be lost or reserved? Um, and so uh, are you thinking of, okay, so in, in okay, so there's a couple things. So there's the LD dash R case, which I think is a little bit different than the static library. Yeah, so if you if you just create a, a static .a file of your final ELF, then yeah, obviously you've lost. I and mean, I think that that's the case also for LTO. It wouldn't be able to you be able to optimize that. But if you do like a um, one thing we'd like to support, and this is why it's, there's some importance on the the, the, the format of these things, we'd like to support LD dash R case where you. We'd like to be able to LD R together just the, like the bit code and these function maps. And so you can, at your final web top new time, still do um, this within the, the LTO. I think it's an issue for LTO today as well. Do you have one last question? Yeah. yeah. So, as part of your um, summary, are you uh, also putting the uh, call graph information so that you can do a, you know, a better partitioning or not? Um, so, Right, so so we're not actually well, we're not really partitioning, um, like in the GCC sense, um, but we want to. It's more enabling at the back end decisions about what to import, um, which I assume is what you're asking about. And so in terms of the call graph, so we we're not putting that there now, but and, and also this kind of addresses um, this gentleman's question a little bit about how you handle the cases where the you really want to in line A, B, and C. Um, you. One of the things we thought about is uh, in that thin LTO um, plugin layer, you could build a dynamic call graph or a partial dynamic call graph and um, try and do something you know quick and dirty with just the hot calls and and do some of the, make some decisions there that you record in the function summary. Um, you just have to be careful that it doesn't become very large. But for for LiPo, where we actually have to build a dynamic call graph at the end of the profile run, it's very manageable in terms of time and memory. So it's definitely possible to do something like that. I just meant uh, not the whole dynamic call graph, but for each function as part of the summary information, mm -hmm. what it calls. So if you ever choose to do that. Oh, okay. Well, right. I mean, so there's two things. Well, if you if you do import that function, then you suddenly you do see what it calls because right. you've imported IR. But yeah, in terms of enabling these, like you're addressing your question. Yeah, I mean that's that's one way of handling it, is is putting a little bit of call information in there. Call graph. Great. Yeah, so I'm happy to